Hey everyone, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, yes, the enthusiasm. Let's do it again. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, let's go. It's good to see each of you today uh, here at Branches. If we haven't met before, my name is Colin. I'm the pastor here. And it's just a delight to celebrate this day together with you. You know, um, there's just every once in a while uh, a year where the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve fall on the same Sunday, and that's this year, and it's just so great that our expectation and our hope come four weeks through, and then we celebrate on Sunday together, uh, and then I get a day off tomorrow. We don't have a Sunday uh, Christmas day like last year, so that's really great. So we can do a full day of worship and singing together and celebrating, and then a day of celebrating and being with our families on Christmas, and so I'm glad that you're here today. You have a lot of options, especially in Houston, so just means a lot to us and our community that you'd be here today. One of the things that we do at Branches is we want to be daring people. That's one of our core values. And part of being daring is that a part of our mission is to cut out anything that's in the way, any obstacle for somebody to follow Jesus or to grow in their spiritual life or uh, to be part of a church community. And we can say, and I'll say because I am one, that, that Christians often do a bad job of inviting people and welcoming people into a community. Uh, I think I heard an amen, uh, which is nice. Uh, I, we believe it. And uh, really the colloquial, colloquial use of kind of that idea of kind of an off-putting person, like a Christian person sometimes, is a red flag. You guys have heard the phrase red flag before? Uh, often in dating, like that person, they have a red flag. I'm not going to go on a second date with them, you know? Uh, so our new series starting Janu in January after uh, next week is called Red Flags. We're going to talk about some of those things. Like, is it, is it a safe place to doubt in the church? Uh, do they use kind of weird lingo? go and insider language? Uh, is it a place where I can truly feel welcome? And we're going to talk about th those things in January. And I just want to invite you to come back after Christmas to come hear us talk about those things and grow together and to be a place that we can invite more people in and cut those barriers out of the way. So I just want to personally invite you to that. And then next, I want to invite you, especially if you're a first time guest, to check in and let us know that you were here today. Uh, we're a better church when we know who is here, uh, that we can connect you to what's going on at Branches. We can invite you to new opportunities to grow and to be in community and to meet other people and to know what series are coming up and stuff like that. And I just want to personally reach out to you too and welcome you uh, to our community. So if you want to scan that QR code and let us know that you were here today, we would love that. We'd love to reach out to you and get to know you. With that, uh, it is Christmas Eve. And so, of course, we want to hear the story, the classic story, the story that many of us remember from our childhood that we sing about and celebrate today, uh, the story of Jesus' birth. And this is the story of Jesus' birth as told by Luke. And we're in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1, the first 20 verses. And it says this. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth who, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen as it had been told to them. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this day, for this celebration, for this fulfilled promise that you have come to be with us, that you are our God and we are your people, and that we shouldn't be afraid 
and that we should be filled with hope and joy and love and peace from this day forward. Make it so, in Jesus' name, amen. I hope tomorrow you get everything you've been asking for. I know I hope the same thing. <laughs> everything you put on your list, everything you hinted at throughout the year, uh, everything you saw an ad for on your Instagram that you didn't know you needed, but now you do know you need, I hope you get everything you asked for. It's the, probably one of the most exciting parts is like you see stuff under the tree and you're like, I didn't wrap that one, you know? I don't know what that is and it has my name on it, it's for me. That's really exciting uh, part of Christmas is, is to be longing for something for so long and to finally get it. Or really, someone knows you so well that you get, they get you something that you didn't ask for but you're so glad that they got it for you. Or classically, you know what's under the tree because you wrapped it for yourself and you just are kind of delaying your gratification till tomorrow. <laughs> Landon and I said, um, this year we got each other a baby, which we did. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, lo and behold, I like come out of my room a couple of days ago and there's stuff to me under the tree. And I was like, all right, the game is on. So now we're gonna like more than just a baby under the tree for each other this year. I hope, I pray, I, I just really hope that you get everything that you've been asking for. But occasionally on Christmas, and not just on Christmas, sometimes on our birthday too, but really on Christmas, uh, you might get a gift uh, that you don't want. And worse than that, not just a gift that you don't want, uh, but one that insults you. I saw a Reddit thread about this that this guy got a stocking from his parents uh, on Christmas, and everything in the stocking was uh, mints and mouthwash and a teeth whitening kit and a toothbrush and toothpaste. Uh, message loud and clear, you know? Uh, this is for you, son. Uh, or uh, someone, their significant other, their girlfriend, got them a stack of books that was like uh, the idiot's guide to etiquette and, you know, like uh, how to get your stuff together and how to find a job, you know? Uh, <laughs> Again, message loud and clear, or one that I've heard about, and I'm just, this is just, this is advice to you because of this one that I read about. Um, husbands, do not buy your wives um, vacuum cleaners <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> Bad idea. Sends a message, doesn't it? Uh, and not only does it send an insulting message to receive a gift like that, like that you're trying to use Christmas to drop a hint to someone, and not even a subtle hint, like a really, like this stocking is full of teeth care stuff hint. Um, more than that, to say yes to it, to receive the gift, to say out loud, thank you for this, is an assent to the gift. Like, yeah, you're right, you know, I should take care of my teeth, or I do need to get it together, or whatever else. To say yes to the gift is one sort of response. Or, of course, you could refuse the gift. You could deny the gift. You could go on an all-out family confrontation at Christmas and say no to the gift, and how dare you give me this gift. And those are two Two responses. And of course, on Christmas, we talk about, uh, when we're talking about this new person coming into the world, Jesus of Nazareth, is this particular type of gift Christians have wanted to say for 2,000 years, a gift from God himself in the flesh, this gift he's giving to people, and we have a response to it. And all I could think about this week, honestly, is like, there's one Christmas Eve sermon, and that's it that God has come to be with us in Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So like my pastor peers or people I work with are like, how's your sermon going? I'm like, I know one part. Uh, I've got that part down, <laughs> that Jesus was born uh, 2,000 years ago to his adoptive father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary, in a manger, and kings came and adored him, and shepherds came to adore him, and there was a chorus of angels singing around him. That part I've got down, it's the after part. It's kind of putting an imperative with it, a command, a, some advice to give with it. Like, how do we respond to the Christian Christmas message that God has come to be with us in Jesus and it actually had some impact in the world? Our Advent series was called Revolution and we were kind of taking that very literally that like this turning is happening and on Christmas, this 180 turn has happened. Now what do we do with it? Now where do we go from here? Is an insulting gift is it an encouraging gift? Is it an uplifting gift? Or is it a gift that we have to do something totally new and radical with our lives? Is it demanding a response? Is it de demanding an answer? Is it demanding that we live our lives in a certain way? And of course, many of us want to say, yes, <laughs> I'm ready to respond. Dorothy Sayers uh, is an author. 
uh, and she writes fiction, she wrote fiction, and she also wrote some like Christian uh, theology and reflection. Uh, and when I was thinking about how there's only one Christmas Eve sermon, this quote came to mind. She says this, for whatever reason, God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death. He had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he's playing with his creation, he's kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace, and this is the most important part, and thought it well worthwhile. Jesus came to be with us on purpose. God took on flesh, came to our state, came to who we are on purpose, intentionally, Christmas is about God's character, his power, his status uh, above us, beyond us, and, and our status where we are. Not necessarily totally hopeless and, and totally without any merit or value. On the contrary, God says, I come to be with you because I love you and I care for you and I want to be with you. And his intentional choice to do that in Christ was well worth the while, was on purpose. I heard it put this way this week, it really resonated with me. You can get down on your hands and knees and play with your dog or your cat or your child, and they can understand that, but you can't discuss and argue theology and philosophy with them. I've tried. Uh, you can't. <laughs> uh, you can stoop down. You can get on their level. You can speak their language. You can play their games, but you can't lift them up to your status as much as you want them to. And in Christian theology, it's, they use the word condescension. In our own world, that's not a kind word because you're essentially saying, I'm up here, you're down here, let me stoop down to your level. But God in his goodness, and actually God in his demonstration of his power, stooped down and said, I, I don't desire to remain apart from you, I wanna be with you, I wanna speak to you. I want to speak your language, I wanna be tempted in every way that you are, I wanna be hurt and harmed in every way that you are, as Dorothy Sayers put it, I wanna go through every irritation of life as you've gone through because I love you. Emmanuel, God with us. There's one Christmas Eve sermon. There's one story. And we read it today, Mary's kind of own response and the shepherd's response and Joseph's response and every other person's response to this good news that God had come to be with his people in Jesus. And in that story, we can just kind of run down how this has happened in, in the second chapter of Luke. That, that, that first we hear this incredible news, this really odd way of describing Jesus' lineage, that he's being adopted into a royal family, that his adoptive father, Joseph, is from the line of David, this Israelite king, that Jesus is now part of that family. And then that, that they took him, and when he was born, they laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And there's a lot of debate in biblical scholarship about what this means. But ultimately, the kernel of truth here is that uh, God was gonna do this no matter where it was. That he's gonna show up and, and take up space and make room even in a manger. That God was determined to do this, and in the place where there was room, he showed up in a manger. And then we kind of cut to another scene that there's these shepherds hanging out in a field, likely very young men asleep, and then a blast of light and a sound, an abrupt sound and a, and a kind of fulfillment of a promise. Hey, there's this, this person who's been born today. It's shocking, it's scary. And the, the angel has the audacity to say, do not be afraid. Like hanging out in the field with your sheep and then bright light and loud noise, of course be afraid, it's scary. Uh, this week I was uh, going in HEB over in Bissonette and over in the um, meat section, uh, there's that like cooking station and there's someone cooking in there giving out samples and they've given that man a microphone. So like I'm walking just like shopping, minding my own business and it's like, sir, you know, would you like some macaroni and cheese? Do not be afraid, you know? <laughs> Here, I have samples, don't be afraid. Uh, and just like that times a million, like an angel, not the H-E-B employee and not macaroni and cheese, but like the son of God is here. <laughs> uh, come and see. And it's amazing, it's so incredible that the, the good news of great joy this gospel, this evangelion is the Greek word that this given, is about this person, is, they're given three titles, Savior, Messiah, and Lord. Well, it's kind of three things we associate with Jesus, but kind of give a really rounded view of who he is. Savior is actually unique to Luke. 
Luke is the only one that uses this term in reference to Jesus in particular during this birth narrative. And it has this universal acclaim that he's here to save all people of all nations. This will be a sign for you and, 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 and you shouldn't be afraid. This is for you, this is for everyone. And second, he's given the title of Messiah. So it's kind of narrowing the view a little bit. This is actually, he's the promised person that was promised to this family of people, the Jews in Israel. And that's this person too. This king has come. And then third, Lord, the, the word that's used not only to describe God, but Lord was also used to describe every political ruler and governor in the area. Maybe even Quirinius was called Lord. He's saying, actually, the actual Lord, the capital L Lord is here. The Savior, the Messiah, the Lord is here. It was like, this is amazing. This angel is announcing it. He says, and you know where we're gonna find him? You're gonna find him in a manger. You're a shepherd. You're familiar with a manger. Go find him. And he's lying in a manger. And so they go. They went with haste, actually. They, they rushed to hear this good news, to see this Savior, Messiah, Lord, laying in a manger. And they find um, unwed parents, maybe even teenagers or early 20s, and this baby, and this is the Savior, this is the Messiah, this is the Lord. And there's two responses. There's the, the shepherd's response, and there's Mary's response. And we can look at the shepherd's response first. Their response is to take it all in, and then they're so full of joy and excitement that they go back out and tell other people about it. And then Mary's response is this. But, so on the contrary, other than the shepherds even, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in their heart. The word pondered here in other uses in the Greek New Testament is like putting something together, like gathering disparate parts in one place. Mary has all this data, all this news that she's been given, all these new experiences, all these shocking new things. Maybe her own status and her own life has changed and she's trying to put it all together. I heard it described this week as she's been given a box that's a 100-piece puzzle, but it has 150 pieces in it. And she's trying to put it together. She's trying to understand. She's trying to make sense of it. There's no way to confirm this, but... Uh, a lot of New Testament scholars believe that Luke, if you read the beginning of Luke, he says, I meticulously set out to write this account of what happened so that I could share it with you and then you could share it with somebody else. That's my paraphrase of that. And then in that account, we get all this interior thinking and feeling of Mary in particular. Well, how would he know that? <laughs> Unless maybe, as I said, some New Testament scholars believe that he probably interviewed Mary. And imagine Luke interviewing Mary and having her review this experience, the review watching her 30-year-old son wander around and make people mad and also gain some followers and do some miracles and turn some water into wine and bring some sight to some blind people and then, and then to anger the authorities and be crucified and to raise from the dead. And then her other son, James, you know, becomes a follower of him and she's reporting all of this. But she's also told him when he had come, when I just gave birth to him, and these shepherds showed up. They were so excited. But I treasured these things and pondered them in my heart. I tried to piece it all. I was still trying to figure it all out. Um, and I think many of us resonate with that more so than the shepherds. There's two good, thoughtful, worthwhile, faithful, understood responses to Jesus coming into the world that we celebrate today. On one hand, I'm looking out and I, I see some, many of you that I know. Maybe you're eager, like the shepherds, to get out. You're like, I'm ready to get out of here so I can tell everybody what has happened. That God has come to be with us in Jesus. And some of you, frankly, I know, just like statistically speaking, uh, uh, were brought here <laughs> uh, to worship today. <laughs> uh, and that's great, and I'm glad you're here. You're welcome here. And you're hearing all this stuff about Jesus and you're thinking, um, give me a minute. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about it. Or actually, I, I used to believe it or I used to be part of a community that believed it and then that community uh, hurt me or harmed me or, or said some awful things about me and I just, I, I, I am okay with Jesus, I think, but I'm not okay with everything else around it. Let me ponder it. Let me try to put it together for a minute. Both are good, faithful, I would even say from my perspective, biblical responses. But on, on one hand, uh, go, tell it. Go share it with the world, what has happened. You're encouraged to do so. And on the other hand, your, your feeling, your thought right now is like, I don't know, I need to consider it for a moment or I need to maybe go back and think about it or I need to argue about it a little bit or read a book or read the scriptures again or, or talk to Pastor Colin about it or another pastor about it. I need to ponder these things in my heart. I need a quiet moment. Jesus' mom did that. <laughs> you should do that too. 
Madeline Ingle uh, is the, the author of Wrinkle in Time, which is a really important book for me in my childhood. She also was a Christian and had a lot of wonderful things to say about the Christian faith. And I think she describes the sharing part. If you're feeling yourself on that end of the spectrum, a really good description of what it means to share. Here's what she says. We draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Not obnoxious, <laughs> not overbearing, not abusive, but to say, look at this, and make people wonder where it comes from. If you're on the other end of the spectrum, if you're thinking about this, I need to ponder it for a minute, I need to put it together for a moment. Uh, other end of the spectrum here is Karl Barth, a Swiss theologian. He says this about pondering it, give you something to ponder. He says, on the basis of the eternal will of God, we have to think of every human being, even the oddest, most villainous, or miserable, as one to whom Jesus Christ is brother and God is father. And we have to deal with him on this assumption. We have to ponder the mystery, the wonder, the earth-shattering thing that God would want to be with any of us. <laughs> and maybe right now you're calling to mind a person, you're like, yes, Jesus is for everyone except... <laughs> and maybe even more than that, and I feel this too, Jesus is for everyone except for me. Jesus is for everyone except for me in my worst moments. Jesus is for everyone and, and is brother to everyone and, and God is father to everyone except uh, this, this person at work I cannot stand or, or this person that's done so much wrong in the world and it's hard for us to fathom that God will wanna be with us. Here's where I think we can when land and, 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 and leave this place, no matter where you find yourself, between the, I'm ready to share it, I'm ready to shout it from the mountaintop, I'm ready to post about it on Facebook, or I'm ready just to sit with it for a minute or maybe reconsider it even just a little bit, is this. Uh, the very root of it, I think most of us are probably mixed in some way. There's this great uh, part in the Gospels where uh, a man says to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Like, people are complicated. I'm ready to share this part, but not that part. I need to ponder this part a little bit more. I think worthwhile sharing uh, is the four weeks of Advent. Hope, joy, peace, and love. Like, I have not met a person. Maybe you can introduce me to one. Maybe it's you who's like, I hate hope. Uh, joy's the worst, you know? No peace, and I don't love anybody. No, no thank you. Even without Jesus, you can at least in some measure, I think, share hope, joy, peace, and love. Go do that. Go share that. That would be wonderful. The world would be better for it. And in some way too, all of us maybe need a little bit of a moment and maybe Christmas is the time to do it. And maybe the new year is the time to do it, to sit and ponder and try to piece it together so that we can share it better. And then likewise, when we share it with others, they give us questions that we need to ponder a little bit more. <laughs> Both are good, faithful responses. The last thing that you need to know that I'm trying to hear for myself, that I'm trying to ponder in my own heart is what the angels say to the shepherds, the root of the good news, whether you're able to share it, ready to share it, prepared to share it, equipped to share it, or you're still pondering it a little bit more. It says this, the, the, the angels to, to, the, to the shepherds. This is good news of great joy to all the people. And the angels say, for you. It's not just good news for you when you believe it, it's not just good news for you when you totally understand it. It's not just good news for you when you have the courage to share it. It's not just good news for you when you've been a good little boy or girl. <laughs> it's good news for you now, today, tomorrow, always. That God has come to be with us in Jesus Christ. And you can't undo that. And your belief or unbelief can't undo that. And no matter how winsome you are and care about sharing it as much as you can, can't undo that. And maybe you're still pondering it. It's still good news for you. Even you, even me, even your neighbor, everyone in this city, everyone in this world, God has said, I want to be with you. And the wonder, the revolution, the way that he did it is he took on flesh and he's Messiah, he's King, he's Lord, and he showed up in a manger. So today, you have two options, two pieces of advice. Leave here today and share it with everything you have. Shine the light so that when others see it, they wonder where the source is from. Or leave here today and be encouraged, assured with confidence. You can ponder it just a little bit more. That's good news. God has come to be with us in Jesus Christ. 
Share it, ponder it, believe it. Thanks be to God for that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the good news that you come to be with us in Jesus, that you've shown us what it means to be people of hope, of joy, of peace, and love. Some of us are eager to leave here and share it by our deed, by our word. Some of us need a minute to ponder, to review, to argue, to research, to look into it more, to understand, to put the pieces together. Thank you for the saints. Thank you for the people ahead of us. Thank you for the shepherds as an example. Thank you for Mary as an example for us. Keep them front of mind for us as we leave this day that we can properly celebrate Christmas by sharing the joy of it and pondering it more deeply. We ask all of this in your name. Amen.